Well, hello everyone. We're here today with uh, Matt Ebden. Hi, Matt. First of all, how are you? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. I was here where I am in Perth. They've actually eradicated COVID since April or May. So there has been zero cases in Perth for five months already. Zero. Absolutely zero. If you had the opportunity to swap any of your titles, or should we say your Grand Slam title uh, in the mixed doubles, would you do that? And which title would you swap it for? Um, look, I would only ever swap it for another Grand Slam title. I mean, it, you know, I know it is a mixed doubles title, but but still, it's a, it's a Grand Slam title. So I'm still very lucky to be able to call myself Grand Slam champion, which is special for me. And also to win a Grand Slam title in my home country, in my home Grand Slam. Um, it means, you know, forever in history, even at the Australian Open, I can always return there for the rest of my life. Um, you know, with my name on, on the trophy or on the board as a Grand Slam champion, which is, is pretty special. And, um, you know, not many people get to do it, especially not in singles and, and you know, in, and also not so much even in doubles or mixed doubles. So um, I feel very fortunate that that, that, that happened. And um, of course, I'm st still working to try to try to see if I can get there also in maybe also in doubles or, or in maybe singles. I mean, it's, it's close to impossible on the singles front, but uh, you have to keep trying and, and keep believing in that. So um, just to swap it, look, um, I would only swap it for a Grand Slam title. I would swap it for a Grand Slam singles title, of course, if I could. But, um, you know, I take what I can get and, um, you know, I do my best and, and sort of see how, how good I can become as a player. And so far in the top 40 last year and the year before. So, yeah, I think, um, no, I, I wouldn't swap it only if it was a Grand Slam. What would you say was your break point in your career? Yeah, I think um, around 22, 23 years old, I was close to the top 100. And then, you know, I had, had a lot of good coaches and a lot of good people working with me. But then I really needed to get to a point where I sort of took ownership of myself and my career and even my coaching team and who I work with and sort of found the best way for me. And, and as such, I yeah, hired one of my older coaches that was a really close friend and mentor to me also at the time. And uh, he, he came with me and, you know, the, the first weeks, I think we went to Asia, actually the second week straight away. I think I qualified, made kind of 16 or quarterfinals in Tokyo in, in the 500 beat some some really you know guys in the top 50 top 40 i think i even won the first set against david ferrer he was maybe number three in the world lost in a tough three setter and then went to shanghai masters had to qualify same thing i beat i think um two guys in the top 60 or 70 to qualify and then i beat two guys in the top 50 or 60 in the first round or two then i beat jill simon who i think was around top 10 at the time and then I think eventually I lost to Andy Murray in the quarterfinals of the Masters. And, um, you know, he won Tokyo and he won Shanghai as well. So the only two guys I lost to those two weeks in those conditions was David Ferrer in a close three sets. And he'd made the final in Tokyo, lost to Murray. Murray in, in Shanghai. So six or six to ten matches against, you know, guys all in the top 50 or 60 or 70 and even some in the top 10 or 20. And um, that sort of really propelled me, you know, that, that meant my ranking went all of a sudden from 120 to like 70. And then, um, you know, breaking into top 100 and, and having some big results in the 500 and the Masters series. And uh, that really goes sort of, you know, uh, cemented my confidence that I, that I knew what I could do and my ability. And that, you know, obviously getting the results just gives you that extra confidence and knowing and uh, you know that shows you that you're doing the right things that you're on the right path and um, you know that, that you can really go from there and then yeah m much of the last eight to ten years has been you know working around that trying to get better trying to improve obviously dealing with you know a few little injuries and, and time off here or there some you know fatigue related stuff uh, lots of travel over all the years so you know naturally sometimes rankings a bit higher a bit lower and then I was also fortunate in the last two, three years to have some of my best years to get, you know, my highest rankings and my best results. Uh, again, quarterfinals in Shanghai last year or year before, I, you know, I beat Dominic Team, who's already was three or four in the world, um, and a few other guys, you know, a lot of the younger guys, up and coming guys. So, 
I know that when I'm fit and playing well and um, you know on, on the right sort of services and conditions that I'm able to play you know almost with, with at the best level in the world or at least at a sort of top 10 level a bit, you know beat Goffin and Wimbledon a big team there in, in Shanghai um, beat a lot of guys in the top 10 or 20 or 30 that that sort of give me that confidence to know that, you know, when I'm playing well and things are going like this, uh, I'm sort of almost more or less able to beat nearly anybody, uh, even on grass. You know, I think quarterfinals of Halle a year or two ago, I lost to Federer. He was number one in the world, of course, and you know, favorite to win Wimbledon. Again, only just losing 7-6, 7-5. I think I beat Cole Schreiber the, the round before. He had won in Halle, I think the year before that or two years before that. So just that sort of, um, belief that nearly anybody that I could could beat and, and even playing Roger on grass at the time I think I'd gotten to the semis of Sir Togenbosch the week before I'd beaten Gilles Muller who won the title there on grass um, you know won a lot of grass court matches I uh, sort of really had the belief that I could beat beat Roger even on grass and I was I think I served for the second set I was up 5-3 and uh, it would have been nice to be in the third set to have a chance to beat Roger. Um, you know, obviously the best grass quarter of all time. So I was obviously really close right there. And then Rafa has been another one. I played him two times and, and haven't been able to beat him. Um, been close to getting maybe a set a set or two here or there. But then he's just pulled away in the long run, especially in the slower conditions in night matches and slower courts or slower hard courts. He's, uh, he's very, very difficult. To, to get around or get past, um, as we all know. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I'm not the only one that, that finds that or knows that. But, uh, you know, it, it's good for me. You know, it, sort of everyone outside, I suppose, Roger and Rafa, I've been able to beat just about or be very close with and and um, also lose to at, at times. But, you know, I know what I'm capable of. Yeah. And uh, for me, that's what keeps motivating and inspiring me. And, and you know, I, I keep trying to improve my game and my my body and mind and, and even as an athlete each year and I suppose that's what keeps motivating me to put in all the you know the training the time working on my body all the travel all, all the sacrifice and hard work and um, yeah I think I think that's just that constant challenge to keep keep getting better even you know even now I'm in my 30s um, but now I feel like I want to play for another decade till now I'm 40 you know like with just uh it seems to just keep going and keep pushing out, um, but it's been definitely last few years really good. But then it comes a point where you always checking your your motivation and your goals and and what they are and what's really motivating you. Um, so it's important for me to have thought about that and and sort of get clear on on why I'm playing and what I still want to achieve and out of the game and and that because you know like anything it's it's a lot of work it's a lot of travel it's a lot of sacrifice a lot of dedication um so you need to be clear on, on what's motivating you i suppose and if you had the opportunity to speak to the 15 year old matt ebden what would you tell him yeah it's a good question uh, definitely a lot um even here while i'm training in in my time these last uh three to six months i'm actually helping a lot of the the best juniors from 11 years old to 19 years old in Perth in, in Western Australia. So um, some of them are some of the best in Australia in their age group and, and others are close. Some will go to college and some will you know, try to go on the tour. So yeah, I've, I've been able to help them a lot and give them a lot of insight and expertise into, I guess the, the probably the, the biggest thing is the perception and understanding and changing their perspective of the game of tennis. Um, you know, I think coming up, you know, until you, unless you have really, really good coaches, world-class coaches, mm -hmm. people that have sort of seen or done it all, that really, really know and understand the game, I think uh, you're always sort of just wondering or guessing or watching on TV, thinking, oh yeah, he does. Federer plays like that or does that, but you don't really understand everything until you sort of really live it. Um, so probably just try to speak to myself as a 15-year-old and show him show my younger self, I suppose, what is needed for, for to become one of the best tennis players in the world and um, really understand all about yourself in tennis and as an athlete and, you know, even mentally, emotionally, physically, uh, all these things and also, you know, all the commitment and work that's needed um, but also, you know, would, would obviously try and give all that info to myself a lot younger so I could even fast track those processes to 
to happen at even even a younger age and even more success early, I suppose, yeah. And if you can share with us a funny story or a moment from from the changing room, as they say, what would it be? Um, well, I probably think of a few first off. So first one, I probably can tell you, I uh, just think of a funny ice bucket challenge when I was training with Andy Murray in uh, Miami. It was it was so hot. I think we were training for four hours in the Miami heat um, before Toronto Masters one year, actually. And, you know, we'd, we'd gone through maybe 10 shirts full of sweat, 10 liters of water and, and drinks each. We finally finished and, you know, that ice bucket challenge was doing the rounds, I think, to raise money for motor neuron disease. And um, Jazz Green, well, I think Andy Murray's physio came and poured a huge giant container of Gatorade ice all over Andy. And, and then we filmed it and said, oh, that, there's your ice bucket challenge. And I was like, give me some of that. I was so hot. So I remember that was a fun little memory, um, something to think about. and. Couple other funny ones. Um, I'm not gonna say exactly the names of who, but definitely in a few change rooms. One time in in Queens, in London, and also in in Sydney, in Australia, in the in the locker rooms. I've been going around uh, to the toilet or to wash my hands or to get ready for the match. And there's a one or two guys that like to stand there almost naked in the in the mirror, looking at themselves, seeing, seeing if they're looking good or not. You know. Um, but I, I'm not gonna name exactly names, but um, yeah, just uh, some funny things like this. Yeah. Would you would you say they're from top ten or top twenty? Um, look, I can't be specific, but at certain times, um, one of them might have been in the top ten. Yeah. Um, currently, I, I can't say that. That will give too too close, but. But yeah, um, no, just just funny times over the last, you know, five years, six years, seven years, I suppose. And um, but yeah, no, in general, it's it's pretty fun. The tour, everybody's different. You know, we got a hundred guys in the top one hundred, nearly all from different countries. You know, some some of the same countries, of course, but it's such a global sport. And and my final question is, if uh, Matt Ebden weren't a tennis player, where would you have been today? Yeah, so after high school, I went to quite quite a serious school, I suppose, in, in sport and in academics. So, yeah, I did well in my schooling and I was entered to study um, a double degree of, of law and commerce, law and business um, and law school. So I was entered in that and, and received enough grades to go and, and do that. So I probably would have done that. It was here at UWA, at the University of Western Australia. It's one of the one of the best, I suppose, law schools definitely in this state, if not the country. And uh, yeah, most likely through through law and um, and and commerce or business degrees. Yeah, would have gone on maybe to become a lawyer or some form of, you know, business or business law or something like that. Um, and even now, with some extra time off tennis, I was able to, you know, start up a few different businesses and investments, and uh, work on a lot of things that I've always wanted to work on a little bit outside of tennis. So that's been something fun. Um, it sort of made the most of the time uh, during COVID, and I was even able to do actually quite a lot of study, um, you know, online courses and certificate courses during COVID as well. So, um, you know things outside tennis that also interest me this year. I've also been able to do a lot because of the, you know, the extra time at home. So yeah. it's been, uh, it's been fun, but you know, I'm, I'm been training most of the last eight, nine months or, or seven, seven months, six, seven months. Mm 